All right, so we ended lecture last time just introducing the three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. And we're gonna just jump into an introduction to conduction today. So first start off with some conduction principles. So we are talking about the sensible component of internal energy and how that is related to um, kind of the motions at a molecular, molecular, molecular level. So the translations, rotations, and vibrations of the atoms and molecules. And conduction is all to do about um, the transfer of heat um, in the sensible form. So basically, You can start off by saying it's related to motion of the atoms and molecules. And we mentioned on Wednesday that you're going to have transfer of energy from more energetic to less energetic particles. And it's caused by two main mechanisms. Um, and conduction can occur in any type of material, so solid, liquid, or gas, so long as it's stationary macroscopically, so there's no bulk motion. Um, but it's easier to explain kind of the mechanisms that cause conduction by drawing like a stationary gas. It's a little time consuming to kind of draw out, but I think it really helps explain how conduction actually works. So we'll go ahead and do it. So say this is a closed container. You've got T1 at the top boundary, which is hot, and T2 at the bottom boundary, which is cold. And then you have some gas molecules inside. And so here I'm gonna use the size of the molecule to represent its temperature. So bigger molecule it just means that it's at a higher temperature. So starting out, you know, after you apply these conditions at the boundaries, you're going to have gas particles that are hotter near the hot temperature and then colder near the cold, near the bottom. And we'll say size is proportional to temperature. Okay, so the first mechanism that causes conduction is known as diffusion. And that's just random motion of the molecules. So as the molecules kind of move microscopically, they're going to move around um, within the medium. And let's see, let's have a dividing line here, kind of between the hot and cold particles. And some of the warmer particles are going to move below this dividing line, and some of the colder ones are going to move above. And so naturally, just by the reordering of the molecules, you're going to have a net heat transfer down toward the colder temperature. So if you end up with you know, hotter particles down here and colder ones up here, it's going to be net transfer of energy downward. So that is diffusion. So we can kind of represent that as you have some kind of well-ordered hot and cold particles, and then they just move around, and you end up with kind of this like all mixed up. So this is just random motion. of molecules. 
And then the second mechanism, so conduction will occur um, just due to the first mechanism alone. And the second mechanism, um, which is collisions between the molecules, just helps to kind of speed the process of conduction up. So as these molecules are moving around, they're going to be running into each other. And if you have a molecule at a higher temperature or higher energy run into one at a lower energy, it's going to transfer some of its energy to the lower energy molecule. So you can represent that as, let's say you have a high energy molecule and a low energy molecule. They run into each other. And then you're going to be left with two that are kind of at this intermediate temperature. And so this just speeds up the process of what diffusion is already doing. So this example was for a gas, but this same process occurs in liquids, except in liquids you have molecules that are closer together, and so the interactions are just stronger and more frequent. And then in solids, you know, the molecules and atoms are locked in like a lattice pattern. So um, you have kind of the same interactions, except they're represented by like waves that propagate through the lattice structure. Um, and that's the case for electrical non-conductors. For electrical conductors, you have the free electrons that are free to move around and kind of help with the conduction process even more. So that kind of makes sense if you think about like what is a good conductor versus what is a bad conductor. So if you have a double pane window, for instance, you're gonna have like gas or some sort of air in the middle to help insulate and reduce heat transfer. Um, and so gas, gases in general are poor conductors. And then something like metal, <laughs> right? You don't like, if you're making soup, you don't like stir it with a metal spoon, right? Because metal is a good heat conductor, because it's a solid, electrically conducting solid, um, so it transfers heat really quickly. So kind of like an intuitive, you know, feel for why these different materials transfer heat well or don't. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so we'll move on now to developing a rate equation for conduction. So this class is all about figuring out how quickly heat is being transferred. So this is going to be our first rate equation. OK. Um, this rate equation for conduction is known as Fourier's law. Um, it's the same Fourier who came up with Fourier series. Um, I don't know if he actually developed the law itself or just kind of like came up with quantitatively how this law should work. Um, but an interesting thing about it is it's phenomenological. So that means it's not, you can't derive it from first principles. It's just based on like experimental evidence, um, empirical basically. So I'll write down. Phenomenological. And we'll kind of go through really quickly what the process of developing this law maybe looked like. Um, so let's say, for example, you had a circular piece of like metal stock. You'll often just have to you know, envision what I'm drawing, just believe me. We'll say this is at T2, this is at T1, and then it's insulated on the lateral sides. And so these dots are used to represent an insulated surface. So the whole kind of circular part of it is insulated. It's got certain length, delta x, and then cross-sectional area of A. 
and then we'll note that T2 is greater than T1. So intuitively sh you should know which direction is heat transfer going to be occurring. It's going to go from T1 to T2, T2, right? So from the colder to the hotter side. So we'll represent that by little q and then x because we've got heat transfer occurring only in the x direction. So what are some properties, just from like looking at the setup of the problem, what are different properties that you think would influence the heat transfer rate? Yes? Wouldn't heat go from the hotter side to the colder side? It definitely Aren't would. Energy? Yeah. Okay. I think I drew that wrong in my notes and then I just like went with it because it's hard to think and write and talk at the same time. Totally. Yes, that's what happened. Thank you. Properties that would influence heat transfer. Your material properties? Material properties, yeah. So we'll say Q of X is going to be a function of a bunch of different things. So material property, we'll represent that by this um, variable K. <laughs> Anything else? Yep. The E difference. Right, temperature difference. So delta T. There are two more things. Right, delta x, so how far um, the heat is being transferred across the distance. Area, right. So the size of the material that the heat is being transferred through. So basically, Fourier or someone determined that heat transfer depends on these four variables and then did a bunch of experiments like holding everything constant and changing one variable to see how that impacted the heat transfer rate and came up with the form of the equation negative K A delta T over delta X This one's pretty important. So this is Fourier's law. And we should note that this is one dimensional. So this is just for a 1D problem, a very simple form of it. And here you're considering, um, you know, a finite temperature difference and a finite difference in X. Okay, so let's take a little sidetrack and talk about the material property K and some other important material properties. And then we'll continue on talking about Fourier's law. So, <clears throat> Are there any questions about the development of Fourier's law? Yes. Um, is it also dependent on time? Is over time it will stop continue like transferring energy? Yeah. So the form that you have here, um, little Q is a rate of heat transfer. So this is like joules per second. Um, so you're basically determining the heat transfer rate. So if you wanted to figure out like how much total energy was transferred over a period of time, you just like multiply by the time. So that rate's just at the instantaneous Yeah, yeah. Good question. And it's a little confusing, like, because we'll talk about flux too, which is like divided by the area. And then when we talk about the first law, if it's just, you know, we're talking, we just have like capital E, we're talking about energy, so that's joules. And then if it's on a rate basis, E dot, and then that is the same unit. So those units are consistent <coughs> with little Q, 
So w in like thermo, you have capital Q, and that's just the energy, and little Q is the energy rate, so joules per second. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. So material properties. We have K, which we've already introduced, is the thermal conductivity. And this has units of watts per meter degree Kelvin. And this is basically determined by the atomic and molecular structure of the matter. And there are different equations, um, some empirical, that you can use to try and determine K. Um, but we're just going to have, typically the values of K will either be given or you, you'll be able to look them up in the appendix. other material properties. I think you're all familiar with density. And then you should be familiar with specific heat from thermo. And that's kilojoules per kilogram K. Um, and kind of intuitively, the specific heat is the energy required to raise the temperature of a specific material, um, you know, a specific, a specific amount of material, a specific number of degrees. And then another one that's important for heat transfer is the volumetric heat capacity. So that's basically density times CP. And that's units of kilojoules per meter cubed Kelvin. So instead of on a mass basis, it's on a volume basis. Um, and it kind of refers to the ability of a material to store thermal energy. So if you have um, uh, a material with a high volumetric capacity, that means it can store a lot of thermal energy. And this is helpful when you're doing um, first law kind of energy balance problems because you can use the volumetric heat capacity as an expression for the um, stored energy. So often you'll see the change in the stored energy expressed as the volumetric heat capacity times the volume times the temperature difference. And so this is representing a change in the stored energy of a material um, basically as it goes from one temperature to another temperature. And then finally the last one is thermal diffusivity. And that is alpha, and it's defined as thermal conductivity divided by the density times the specific heat. And that's in units of meters squared per second. That's what that simplifies down to. And it's basically comparing the 
think this should be row CP on the bottom. Sorry about that. Because it's comparing the ability of a material to store thermal energy versus its ability to conduct it. So thermal conductivity K, the ability to conduct um, heat, and then rho CP, the ability to um, uh, the uh, volumetric heat capacity, so its ability to store it. So basically if you have a large diffusivity, the material is going to respond quickly to thermal changes. It's going to diffuse the thermal changes quickly. And then a small alpha will take longer to come to equilibrium. Yes? Yes, alpha. Yeah. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so we'll go back to Fourier's law now that we know a little bit about the variables that are in it. So here we'll say we have delta T is a temperature difference T2 minus T1 over a certain length. And because heat is always transferred from a hotter side to a colder side, um, like in our example, T1 is the hotter side and T2 is the colder side. So you have heat going from the hotter to the colder. Sorry, T2 is the hotter, T T1 is the colder. Um, oh, that's why I had that confused. Yeah, okay. Because typically, if you have um, a delta, you're going to say T1 is the direction something's leaving and T2 is arriving. So you have T2 being your colder side, T1 your hotter side. So then that will result in this quantity always being a negative quantity, which is why you have the negative in the equation. Because you want your heat rate to be positive. Does that make sense? A little confusing, maybe. Wait, which one is the hotter one? Yeah, so <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> so making sure I'm writing this right. So T2 is going to be colder. T1 is going to be hotter. So I did have the arrow drawn correctly. I just had the greater than sign flipped. So this is kind of just like the nomenclature, the standard nomenclature. And then can you just briefly show the correction? Sure. Thank you. So we've got T2, which is less than T1, so colder. T1, hotter, heat transfer going from the hotter side to the colder side. And then our delta T, whenever you have a delta something, it's you know the second minus the first, right? And because T2 is colder than T1, this quantity is always gonna be negative. Okay, so to correct for that, we have a negative in front of the um, conduction equation. So then we always have a positive heat rate. Okay, straightened out? Cool, yes. And then like we were discussing earlier, the units of the heat transfer rate are joules per second, so energy per second, which is also known as watts. That looks like multiplication, which is equal to watts.
So if we want to take the limit as delta x goes to zero, so now we're going to look at the heat transfer across an infinitesimally small piece of material. Then our delta T is also going to go to zero. And then we get the differential form of Fourier's law. So dt dx instead of delta T delta x. So now just instead of over a finite distance, we are looking at the heat transfer rate over an infinite, infinitely small distance. And then we often want to look at the heat flux, so this Qx double prime, and that's just equal to the heat rate divided by the area across which, yes? That's not the nomenclature that's used, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, so it's, it's the little Q is the heat transfer rate. So capital Q is like joules, and then little Q is the rate on a time basis. This is what it is in the book, so I want to stick with it, but yeah, good question. And then this double prime does not have anything to do with derivatives. Um, this is also the, the nomenclature of the book, um, so it's the flux, so the heat transfer rate per unit area. So just dividing the whole thing by the area. Let's so let's label this heat rate, and then this one is heat flux. And that's going to be watts per meter squared. Okay, so that's um, basically introduction to the conduction rate equation, Fourier's law. So we determined that the heat transfer rate is dependent on the temperature difference, the size of the material, the distance that the energy is being transferred across, um, and then the property thermal conductivity, so the property of the material. Okay. So we'll talk about directionality of heat transfer now for a little while. Okay, I'm going to bring our one-dimensional example back up. So here we said we had T1 that was constant across this entire surface, and then T2 that was constant across this entire surface. So we'll have some kind of intermediate sections. And if the lateral surfaces are insulated, then this system is going to be basically axisymmetric. So you're only going to have a variation in heat in the x direction. 
obviously x direction that way so let's say we have some different temperatures t3 and t4 and all of these surfaces are known as isothermal surfaces So basically the temperature is constant along that surface or on the entire surface rather. And so heat flow is always perpendicular to an isothermal surface. So here we've got Q sub X and because it's um, the temperature variation is axisymmetric and it's only varying in the x direction. We only have heat transfer in the x direction and it's going to be perpendicular to these cross-sectional areas, the isothermal surfaces. So this is a really, um, okay, let's, I guess let's write that out. Conduction perpendicular to isothermal surfaces. So this is a really simplified problem, right? You've got kind of a perfect material. It's perfectly insulated on the lateral surface. But in reality, conduction is going to occur in all three directions, typically. And so we have a general form of Fourier's law that is a vector. So because um, heat transfer can occur in all three directions, it is a vector. And let's write this as the flux. Sorry, upside down triangle, del. So we've got the thermal conductivity and then um, del T. So T is the temperature distribution in the entire object. So basically it's a function of all three spatial coordinates and time. Um, so it tells you what the temperature at every point in the object is. And then um, the del operator takes the partial derivative of the temperature in all those directions. Um, so it's basically telling you how the heat rate or what the heat rate is in X, Y, and Z. And so the temperature field T is um, a scalar quantity. It's just the temperature at each point. And in the, this equation, um, you still have heat transfer perpendicular to isothermal surfaces. And one kind of inherent assumption that we're making here is that the material is isotropic. So that means that its properties do not vary in space. So we can pull K out of the derivatives. And that's going to be an assumption that we're going to make in this class. So by having K be a constant, we can pull it out of the derivative. And that's assuming that the material is isotropic. So what we, the kind of form of Fourier's law that we had before, or of the heat flux that we had before, was just this first part, because we were only, we were assuming the problem was only one dimensional. So we could cancel out, there's no heat transfer in the Y or Z directions. So we just have um, 
the flux is equal to negative k delta t delta x. And then you could do the same you know, with the y and z components. Okay. Let's do a quick example problem, a quick conduction example problem. Okay, so we're gonna have a window. I'm gonna draw it in 2D. It always takes way longer than I want if I try to draw it in 3D, but you're welcome to do that. So the window is made of glass. This side of it is 15 degrees Celsius, the inside of a room. This side is negative 20. It's a cold day. We've got, let's say our thickness, which I'm gonna represent as L, is five millimeters. The width of the window is one meter and then it is two meters tall. We know the thermal conductivity of glass. It's 1.4 watts per meter K. And then we have our temperatures. So first off, which direction is heat gonna be transferred? Based on the board right to left, hotter to colder, inside to outside. And we just wanna find QX. So it's always good to think through kind of, even if you're working on a simple problem, what assumptions you're inherently making. So we're gonna assume that the inside of the window is an isothermal surface, the outside is an isothermal surface. So heat transfer is only one dimensional in the x direction. And we're gonna assume also that um, the material is isotropic. So what form of Fourier's law do we wanna use for this? You can go ahead and just like write it down and try to work it out a little bit. So we basically have, so we want the heat rate, not the heat flux. Um, so there's only like a couple choices we can make here, right? So we're saying it's one dimensional, so we don't need the complicated vector form of the equation. And we're looking at the heat transfer over this finite distance, this finite thickness of the window. So we're gonna have delta T over delta X. And that is T2 minus T1. And then delta X here is just the thickness L. Um, and then just for purposes of being thorough, I'm gonna write out all the values here and the units so you can kind of see how this all shakes out. Um, the area, two meters squared. Make sure to convert the thickness to meters so we have consistent units. And then the one thing I wanna point out here, the reason I wrote this all out is because you have Kelvin down here and Celsius up here, right? But because this is a temperature difference and the difference um, in Kelvin and Celsius is the same, like the, um, I guess distance between each degree is the same, right? To convert, you're just like adding 273. So if you added 200, 273 to both, the subtraction would still be the same. Um, but you need to be careful because you don't have to convert when you're talking about differences. Um, but if you're talking about just an absolute temperature, then you do. Okay. And that's gonna give us 0.5 
19,600 watts. Does that make sense? Yeah. So would we need to, for an assumption, say that like the top and the bottom are thermally insulated or? Yeah, technically. Yeah, you would need to say there's no heat transfer this way. Yep. Oh, yeah. Or sometimes the assumption is that it's just so thin that the heat transfer in those directions is going to be negligible. One of the two. But for like homework, you'd want us to say something like that? Um, I don't specifically, so I want you to say, you know, given fine and solution, I don't specifically ask you to like write out the assumptions. I do want you to think about them. Um, but there are some problems where I'm going to tell you to like, okay, start with the general form of the first law or the general form of the Fourier's law, and then tell me why you're canceling terms and then how you get to the solution. Okay. All right, any questions on that? Okay. We're going to start in on another important equation now, the heat diffusion equation. So this is going to tell us the temperature distribution within an object. Um, and we're interested in that because if we know the temperature distribution as a function of x, y, z, and time, we can easily calculate dt dx by just taking the derivative, right? And you need dt dx in order to solve Fourier's law for the heat transfer rate. So we're going to go through how you can um, basically, with a differential element, um, or material, um, how given the boundary conditions, so what the temperatures are on the boundaries, and then the initial condition, um, so what uh, the, the state of the material is at a given point in time, how you can calculate the temperature distribution um, as a function of all those variables. So this is used to calculate T of X, Y, Z, and time. And then that is an input into Fourier's law. Okay, we probably won't get super far into this, but maybe the hardest part, which is going to be drawing this differential element. I'm going to give that a try. I feel like I should move the page so you guys can't watch me do this. <laughs> okay, a little wonky, but not too bad. Okay, so we're going to have the size of the element dx, dy, dz. We're going to assume there's some energy generated inside, so eg dot, and that there's some change in the stored energy of the element. So e stored dot. And that's inside the differential element. <coughs> Define our axes, which is important. <coughs> 
Z. Okay. And then we're going to have basically heat coming in and out of every surface. So. Sometimes it's probably going to be hard to tell exactly like which surface this is indicating, but I'm just going to try and draw the heat transfer lines, you know, in the x direction parallel to the x axis. So coming in, you've got some Q sub x. Going out, you've got some Q x plus dx. So at the x surface and then the x plus dx surface. Q sub z, z plus dz, and then hardest one, y. y plus dy. Okay. everyone kind of have that I think I can leave it on okay so we'll start with the first law that we defined for heat transfer on a rate basis change in the stored energy is the rate of energy in minus the rate of energy out plus the rate of energy generated and remember we mentioned that the energy coming in and out can be due to heat, work, or advection, so energy coming in and out with the mass flow. We're going to assume for this derivation there's no bulk motion. So that means that the work and the advection are zero. So that gives this kind of more simplified form of the equation. With conduction in, conduction out, and then the energy generated. Okay, we will pick back up here on Monday. I am going to post a homework assignment today, this afternoon. Um, it'll be a little shorter than normal, so it's due on Wednesday, but because you don't have a full week, it'll be a little shorter than normal. Um, Shin has office hours starting at like 1230, which probably won't be super helpful for the homework, but if you have concept questions. And then we have a bunch of office hours Monday and Tuesday. Um, so it's really easy to be in class and like listen to the concepts and you're like, yeah, this is super easy, I understand, and then get to the homework and have like no idea what you're doing. So feel free to come in, ask questions, understand it.